Viktor Frankl said, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson. Stay tuned for the next hour as Sue explores the human psyche, what makes us tick and how to live better, more fulfilled and more meaningful lives. Only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on High FM on the Finding Human program. And today my guest is Ivor Wolf and his wife, Aroni, who's sitting next to him. And I saw his daughter in the background. We're on Zoom to Israel. And uh, it's just so nice to connect with you, Ivor. Uh, I had a lot of feedback from our program last week, and if anyone would like to listen to it, it was Roni's story, and you'd find it on the Chai FM Finding Human if you go on to Google. Chai FM Finding Human. And you have a look under Ava and and uh, Ronnie Wolf, and it's there, her wonderful story. Hello, Ava. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. What with today's program, we're going to dedicate this because this is what you wanted to Madame Mar- uh, Marie Bloom, knee mm-hmm. Alper. And yeah. would you like to tell me why you wanted to um, dedicate it to her? She's she's uh, certainly the reason why why Ronnie in fact survived the Holocaust. There's no. No, there was no other. She was at the right place at the right time and happened to do all the right things. If you had to write a story, her story, you you would think it's fiction Mm. because to work out when the the Germans raided, to work out that she had a delaying tactic, that she needed that she needed to delay them for whatever reason. It was impossible that she took the head of the Gestapo to a room and told him that there were two boys that that were had had infectious diseases. And even though even the boys told him it wasn't true. And then again, <laughs> when she got to the siding, and she used that as an excuse with the, with the German officer to keep the children in a shed. And she, there again, she saved her. And again. There was, and, and again, when the, when the Germans raided some months later, whenever they were short of people to load onto the, they knew that these children were available, and they they and then they got hit that the Germans were coming, and they uh, she cleared them out. She took all the children out, took so, off their stars of David, and took them away. Amazing. So the Germans never. She saved them many many times. So let's just uh, go back to her story for a moment. She was a young woman of twenty six. Um, yeah. And she was in charge of the Wiesenbeck Orphanage. Ron, Ronnie and her sister Regina, Ronnie was two years old, and her sister Regina, when their parents were taken, and they were found wandering the streets in Belgium. And yeah. it was, they were sent to uh, Marie Bloom, is that right? Well, Alper Correct. she was at Correct. the time. Correct. And and um, Ronnie Ronnie says that she remembers just being helped by Marie all the time. Isn't that a lovely thought? Now, Ava, I just wanted to go back to you. Last week, you sat next to um, Ronnie. I'm sure she's there next to you. Is she's she? Next to okay, me on but my she's right, right hand side. hello, Ronnie. You're keeping very quiet. <laughs> um, Ava, I wanted to know from you. You wrote a book for Roni. Tell me about that book. Okay, I I I don't know why I delayed it. For many years, we we collected all kinds of things. We collected a book from Marie Bloom when we visited her. A book that she'd written in French. I had I had someone translate certain sections for me, and I, my intention always to write a book. I don't know why I waited for Ronnie's for our fifty eighth wedding anniversary, and I decided like a year before that, that this was going to be my gift to Ronnie. I thought, what could I give her? And I'll give her this this book. And then I had help. I had wonderful helpers. I had people that got, went to Yad Vashem and picked out things. I had people that translated Marie Albert's book. I had I had a wonderful woman who explored the, the Polish side. And I, in fact, I actually had much more information than went in the book. Eventually, the people who published the book limited me to 120 pages. So I left out 
I left out it, which is I'm really sorry about, but I, I will I will do it again. I'll do it again, and I'll add another chapter, which I'll tell you mm -hmm. about later. Mm -hmm. But I, the, and I, I finished the book just before our 58th wedding anniversary. I took Ronnie that evening to a hotel for our anniversary, and she thought that was her present. And then I presented her with a book. So what uh, was her I, reaction? Yeah, you, you can. Her reaction was, oh, you can see Look at see that. Them. Um, just for anyone who's actually listening to us, and hopefully there are lots of you, there's a beautiful mm -hmm. picture on the book front of Ronnie. And uh, and it's and what we'll just go down a bit more, it says, My Darling Ronnie's Story. It's beautiful. If you would yeah. like to contact us, please do so on SMS 34519 or you can telegram us on 61 895 Now, a lot of people have stopped me during the week, um, Ava, or phoned to talk about our program last week, and, you know, it really it touched everyone's hearts. But they wanted to know, before this book, they wanted to know a bit about you and your upbringing and what got you to Israel. So can we go uh, back a bit? Yes, we could go back. I, I actually was very influenced by by a few people in my life. The one story I would like to tell is my grandparents, because my father was away. I was born, in, obviously, in the war years. My father was away in the South African Defence Force fighting in in the, at the time in North Africa and then in Italy. So he came out. I was really a... I was really a, a little a little boy, but and I so he was and my mother worked so I lived with my auntie Janie and who influenced me my auntie Janie also living with us were my grandparents, my grandparents were from Lithuania they would escaped from Lithuania before the First World War and my grandfather was a great influence on me because when my grandmother passed away I shared a room with him so he was a great influence he wouldn't let me go to kindergarten. Because he said the kindergarten were all goyim, and I, I, sh I should, and I spoke fluent Yiddish. So when I got to grade one, I spoke Yiddish. I think everyone was sure that I came from Lithuania. They were sure that I'd just got off the plane. But I was born in Johannesburg. Anyway, he was an interesting character. He was, he was left for dead in a pogrom in his city just outside of Kovna in the 1800s, and the, he he survived that eventually ended up in South Africa with his wife. And the other side of my family, we're three quarters Lithuanian, because the other side of my family was a, even a more interesting character. He was a grandfather called Heinrich. He changed his name. Uh, South Africa called him Harry, but Heinrich Wolf. And Heinrich Wolf decided in Hamburg in the 1800s, end of the 1800s, he decided he wanted to leave and get to Australia. I'll try and cut it short. He he took a uh, he, he he pretended to be a cook, took a took a job on a cargo ship that was due to leave Hamburg and end up in Australia. I'm sure it took many many months. In Australia, he ran away. He escaped. They managed to ca catch him. They brought him back on ship, and they took away his passport, all his ID. Mm. Cut a long story short, he still had in mind escaping, and when they were on their way back down to Germany, they were passing the Durban Harbour. What he did is he had no papers, no passport, nothing. He dived in the water and he swam. Shark-infested oh, shark waters. In, yes. Shark-infested waters in Durban swam to shore. No oh. papers, no, no, absolutely no ID. He hid himself. He found the Jewish community and they hid him for many, many, I don't know how long, wow. many, many months. And they sent for his, it was the time, you can imagine, the 1800s, it was before the before the First World War. During the First World War, also more interesting, he married, eventually got his papers, eventually they got him a passport, I don't know how, and he eventually married and had children. During the First World War, because he had a German passport, they arrested him, mm -hmm. put him in a, a Jewish Jewish uh, German born, they arrested him, put him in a POW camp with other Germans in Wintook in, in Southwest Africa. Hmm. There he spent the, by, most of the war years in the First World War. We're going to have to get back to that. That's very interesting. Thank you, Craig. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. 
Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program, and I'm back with Ava Wolf in Israel. And if you'd like to contact us, please do so on 34519 or telegram us on 061 895 Just needed to say that our story, Ava's story, is a follow up of our last week's one, which was with his wife, uh, Ronnie Wolf. And if you'd like to hear that, please go on to the uh, Chai FM Finding Human on Google and you'll find us there. Okay, Ava, so your your uncle, you were saying that uh, he he managed to get his passport. But, I mean, I can't believe it. You've got a very resourceful family. He was family. my grandfather. He was yeah. my grandfather. Okay. He was the wolf side. He married a Lithuanian lady. And he ended up in a in a POW camp, can you believe it, in, in Southwest Africa. Not only that, the community came. He lived in a place in Durban. You, you people know well on the Maria. He had at the time four children. The community came at the time. They were very pro pro British at the time, and they came to burn the house down. They actually came with torches to burn his house down, and it took them time for the wife to explain to the people before they torched the house that this he was really a Jewish a Jewish born German huh. uh, citizen, and he happened to come to South Africa. And they actually at the last minute turned back. They had a, a whole, they spoke about it many times. Anyway, I was very influenced by the grandparents, both he and my my uh, my Lithuanian side. They were three quarters Lithuanian, and I lived really most of the time with them and my auntie Chaney, and, and that was my influence. And I think they instilled in me this interest in, in what happened. In 1948, we had radios. We didn't have TV, mm. and we listened. I listened with my grandparents, and they I translated for them. They translated for me everything that came out of Israel because we were so interested in what was happening and establishing a new Jewish state. It became, that was that we, we lived and we breathed and we spoke. We, I was seven years old, and we, that's all we spoke about. Where about did you live in Jewish South Africa? State. I lived in a, in a suburb called Mayfair. Oh, in also Johannesburg. Mm. Mayfair, Johannesburg. What was interesting about Mayfair is we lived in a very Jewish community, very many Jewish people. We had a, our own shul. But not only that, we shared Mayfair with Lebanese and mm. Lebanese Christians. And we got on famously. We mm. never had a problem. The anti-Semitism we only experienced because I had to cross the, the railway line and go to a school called E.P. Bowman, which was in Brixton. There, for the first time, I actually experienced anti-Semitism. Never, mm. never, never felt it. Not in not in my section of Mayfair. I was on the opposite side of the railway line. Okay. I had to, in fact, coming home. I should tell you the story. Coming home, I was nervous to go through the tunnel. Walked. I was in grade one. Nervous to go through the tunnel to uh, under under the railway line because I there were kids waiting to give us a good hiding. And mm. I crossed the railway line. I uh, took my life in my hands at the time. I think <laughs> about it. Crossed the railway line. Not not going under the ground. Anyway, just just an mm. interest. The 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 thing that did have an influence on me with Israel later was my brother. He was six years older than me. His name was Aubrey Wolf. He was a leader of the Beitar Beitar movement in South Africa. Was from a very young age, and he used to read me. I was a kid. He read me parts of Jabotinsky's books, and he he. I would I would say he tried to brainwash me. Maybe he succeeded. <laughs> so I was. I was keen to come. When I was 16 years old, my mother did me a favor, and she felt I was very close to my brother. He'd volunteered at that time to to fight in the Six Day War in uh, 1956. Not the Six Day War. Not the Six Day War. The war it was uh, the in Sinai campaign. Sorry. Yeah, it was yeah. The Mm -hmm. Sinai campaign, not the Six Day War, you're right. It was the Sinai campaign. He volunteered and he found my mother did me a favor with school holidays. She said, okay, I'll take you to Israel to see your brother. I met him. He was in army uniform. I went to his base. I spent time with him. I had a wonderful time. And I think that uh, that made up my mind that there was no way I was going to be finished my trick and I was going to go back to Israel. And then that happened. I, I, I joined a group of 16 other South African volunteers. The interesting thing about that was the South African at the time started ha having a call up to the to the South African Defence Force, mm -hmm. and we all decided, most of us decided that if we were called up, 
obviously we'd go to the South African Defence Force. But if we missed the call-up at the time, there was like a, a ballot lottery. Mm. We missed the call-up, we'd come to Israel. So of maybe 30 youngsters, uh, 16 of them finally weren't called up. And we, I was one of the lucky ones. And we ended up in Israel and there mm. as a volunteer. That's for the fascinating. Mm. Yeah. And then when did you meet Ronnie? Okay, Ronnie... The interesting thing, because we have in Israel, we have a thing called the Surfing and Zionist Federation. Very, very, uh, very active, wonderful people connect connect with all the South African immigrants right through from 1948 or prior to 1948 until this day. So the Surfing and Zionist Federation met us, and they got us ready for army. They taught us a little Hebrew. And at the time, the British Zionist Federation contacted the African Zionist Federation. They somehow heard that we had a group of 16 English-speaking youngsters, plus one little girl, a girl called Adrian Kramer, and also from Johannesburg. And they said they've got two little girls that have finished a year on a kibbutz. They were volunteered to work on a kibbutz for a year. And they want to stay on. They want to volunteer for the army. And will we, will our group accept Two little girls. We, we it was it was called in Hebrew. They called it a garin. I don't know what the perush of a garin, but it's a garin. So we 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 actually took these two little girls in with us. When you say little the, girls, were they teenagers? They were they were eighteen and nineteen years old at the time. They were all of age. They only accepted you when you were eighteen years old to the army in Israel. And so where they were they over. coming from? They came from a they. Both of them came from London. Mm -hmm. Ronnie was from London and her best friend Pearl from London as well. But they lived on a kibbutz near Haifa. They went on a year's, uh, what they call Shnatshirut, a service to the kibbutz for a year. They got very, very much, they were, they were in fact adopted, both of them, by kibbutz families. They kept in touch over the years. Anyway, they joined us. And Ronnie was, her Hebrew was a little better than Pearl, so she joined us. In the, in, the, in the military camp where we did basic training, they joined us at our, for our Hebrew lessons. That's contact that we had. The interesting story is, I don't know why, Ronnie had met one of the boys before. One of the boys who was up there, a fellow called Basil Joffe. And one night I was being punished. I was a naughty soldier. <laughs> I, I didn't really, I, I deserved punishment from time to time. And I was being punished. We were going on a route march the following day. It was a strenuous mark, and the officers decided that I wouldn't sleep that night. So they made me guard the armory. Yeah. So I was guarding the armory. The armory was about, a, I would say, at least a meter off the ground, and the girls had arrived. The girls came to the camp much later than us, and Basil knew these girls. So Basil said, I've got someone to introduce you to. And it was middle of the night. I was on patrol inside a barbed wire fence. <laughs> I was a meter taller because I was standing much higher. And suddenly Basil pitched up with Ronnie and said, yeah, I want to introduce you to a nice guy. And obviously she thought I was a, at least six foot tall because <laughs> I was standing I was standing a meter above her and I was talking down to her. didn't realize I was close to being a midget. <laughs> How, how tall are you? I'm, a, I'm about, I don't know, five foot, five foot six. Can, can I say something? Yes. Now? He's five foot six. He tells everybody in Israel he was six foot four, <laughs> and he made me and I made him four, four foot six. <laughs> <laughs> I love Very, that. You are a giant name. of a man, though. You really are. <laughs> uh, but, so That's go on. True. <laughs> anyway. So that was my first meeting with Ronnie. Well, in the middle of the darkness, behind the barbed wire fence, I was armed. She was with a friend of mine, and that was my first meeting. Anyway, we we I I, I think with Ronnie, I got to know through through the Hebrew lessons because we did training and they did training. The only time we got together was during the Hebrew lessons, and the girls' camp wasn't they didn't they weren't in our side of the camp, but we had an interesting thing during the army period. They took us on various uh, tiulim, you know, uh, mm. to explore the country. One of the tiulim we went on was on uh, the Masada. And we decided, I don't know, a couple of us decided we're going to climb Masada on foot. We're going to leave early in the morning and we're going to see the sunrise on top of Masada. And I think that's where Ronnie and I actually got together, first time ever. That's we became from then on, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. Do you think I, I you think were actually, absolutely exhausted by the time you got to the top? 
<laughs> I could not, yeah, I, I couldn't fight back. <laughs> <laughs> she hooked you, Ava. <laughs> yeah. That's you that's hooked each cool. other. And 63 <laughs> years later, you are still hooked. Years, Isn't that wonderful? Still, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, Ava, I would like to, we're sort of jumping ahead a bit, but yeah. you sent me the, the story about the the um the, the book From the Children's Home to the Gas Chambers by Renia Heinzman. Would you tell very me? Important. Yes, that's such an important story. Tell it's me a, a bit about that. Story. The, the, I, I one day get a phone call, and I'm busy. I get a phone call from, I can see it's an overseas call, and the man says to me, he introduced himself briefly. He said, look, I'm looking, I'm trying to find a girl called, her, her name originally was Raisel Varman. I'm looking for a Raisel Varman. He happened to pick me. So I said, I happen to know this Raisel Varman very well. He said, how do I know her? I said, I'm married to her. Mm. So from that moment on, he and I, he was from Holland. He was studying. He was at the time studying to be a lawyer and studying law in a university in Holland. And we became very friendly. And he phoned me from time to time. And eventually what he did is he sent me a photograph. And the photograph, I had a copy of that photograph. I'll show you the photograph now. Now, what I'll year show. was this? This was, it's about two years ago, 2020, uh, 21. Mm -hmm. But this is, you can see the, the, this is a part of the photograph. It's a book that he wrote. Right. Anyway, I, I don't know how he did it, but he actually took a photo. He, he was asked, he got a bursary from the, from the museum that they were building, which is apparently a three-hour drive from where he was studying, in, in Belgium, to the siding, where Jews had left a lot of their goods on getting onto the train, and they'd kept the things there very neatly in, uh, in Belgium, and they decided to build a museum there. And they gave bursaries to people who would help them. He collected photographs of children. Why he took that, no, no idea. And he decided not only he was going to help them put the, this museum together, he was going to find these children. Now, if you gave anyone a photograph and you showed you know the photograph, you've seen the photograph, if you show that and you tell, tell me to try and find anyone there, I would never know. Mm -hmm. He actually traced every single person in the photograph. That photograph was taken of children that were saved by Marie, Marie Bloom from the siding mm -hmm. in Dossin in, in Michelin. The, those were the children that were loaded back onto a truck after Marie Bloom managed to get them out of there after the Germans intervened mm -hmm. and sent them back to this to their their uh, back, to their the orphanage. orphanage. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is an amazing thing. He managed to trace them. Well, not only did he trace them, he put us together two years ago on a Zoom. We spoke to the children. Ronnie had never seen her for more than 70 years. Mm. The little girl standing next to her in that photograph is a girl called Annie. They were all adopted. All these children were adopted eventually, most of them in America. And most of them have done the amazing thing. Most of them have done extremely well. We're still in touch with them. They survived. I don't know how. Not only have they survived, but they've thrived. And they've all done very well. They, there's a One is a film producer. What is a, they're, they're all in, in their own, but the one that Annie was standing, only one girl standing next to her, mm. she was adopted by a, a non-Jewish family and brought up as a, as a non-Jewish girl. And also when Ronnie spoke to her, they hadn't seen each other for 70 years. Mm. It was as if they'd, they'd been together all their lives. Oh. They spoke on the Zoom. It was wonderful. Yeah? I, 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 and I just... I just sorry. I just want to add one thing. Most of them were in the field of um, looking after humanity, like doctors wow. and dentists, and mostly teachers. Hey, yeah, isn't that it's fantastic? That everyone, everyone was like you know they they were involved with with human philanthropy, beings. and Absolutely. you know. Um, when I look at this little girl, this Annie that you're talking about, very pretty little girl, she doesn't look Jewish. Has she ever gone back to her roots of Judaism? Or I has don't she... think so. I don't think so. And she the rest married, of them? Married, uh, oh, she's she a, Mormon, a, Mormon. a Mormon. Oh, wow. She's a Mormon. And she, just tell me adopted. the story about your daughter who, who saw a, a photo. That's before the book, I think. That's, yeah, my daughter, Yaela, she's here with us at the moment. I'll introduce Hi, you. Hi, Yaela. Yeah. Yaela, 
She could tell the story. She could. Yeah, come here, Ella. You yeah, Ella, come story. and tell us the story. Tell us the story. Come. She has a good time. It was interesting, interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ella. Yeah. Hi, yeah, yeah, Ella. How are you? Nice good to day. see you. Tell me, okay. tell me how you saw this photo and where it, where it was. So um, I was a young mother with four little kids working hard <laughs> at the end of every evening at about 10, 10, 30, 11, I used to sit down and if I had a moment, I would look, uh, read the newspaper. And one evening, just before the Holocaust uh, Memorial Day in Israel, I opened the newspaper also thinking, should I just throw it out or okay, I'll sit for 10 minutes, look through the paper. And I opened the center page in the, in the newspaper, and there was a photo of a little baby, about three years old. And I looked at this photo, and it was like all my children, my brother's children, oh. they all sort of had that same exact face Good and that same look. And there were six photos that were taken, and it was written in the article that they ran the hundreds and thousands of photos in Yad Vashem in Israel of children of the Holocaust that nobody knows who they are. And they just chose six random photos and put them in the paper saying that there's still so many Holocaust survivors without knowing who they are. And I looked at, at the bottom, it was very, very small letters that this specific photo was collected in Belgium at an orphanage, mm. and it just all sort of fell into place. Mm. Gee whiz. Uh, I've got that photo, Ava. Yeah, I have. And I and I looked at this photo, and I phoned my mother. It was 11 o'clock at night, and I phoned my parents, and I said, can I come over to you? And they said, sure. And I took this newspaper, and I drove over to them, and I just placed the newspaper, opened the newspaper, placed it on the kitchen table, and I said, who it's is this? You. It's you. And she, it's said, you. It's and she you. said, it's me. Yes. Wow. I said, it's you. She said, it's me. I remember that vividly. It's I remember you. them bringing their, she says to me, I remember them bringing a photographer because they were going to um, try and find adoptive parents for these children. They took photos of the children in the home and my mother was taken with a teddy bear and the and that was it and she said it's me i remember oh. having the photo taken wow it gives me cold shivers yeah ella we just got to go to break this is finding human with sue jackson only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 High FM. My guest today is Ava Wolf and his daughter Yael came in and Yaela and told us a bit about the photograph. So pleased to have met her. You know, a message actually came through to me this week. And it was after those four little Colombian children were found alive in the jungle, uh, I think 40 days after they had been stranded there. And they said, after listening to Ronnie last week, that they couldn't believe that it took 70 years for these little orphans' photos to be published and people asking, you know, does anyone know these children? Those little Colombian children, they were stuff was being dropped for them. They were being searched for. They were found. Unfortunately, the Jewish orphans who didn't manage to get into orphanages were all killed. The Jewish orphans, and as this, this person who sent this to me said, and all the other undesirables in brackets. Isn't that true, Ava? Absolutely. They're terrible. All right. Now you're going back to Hans. Then I'm not Hans. Um, Renia Hansman. Yeah. So Renia, in fact, I think 
in my opinion, I mean, I, I don't really know. I, I think he devoted so much time and so much of his effort to putting together these children and kept us all in touch, one name with another. It's a sad story. It ends very sadly. We actually presented his book to Yad Vashem. He wrote a book, and all the all of the children, all the children have a, a, a section. He gave them all a section in the book, and everyone wrote a part. Everyone thanked him, of course. It was an unbelievable effort on his part. But it, eventually, I, I, we invited him, of course, to Israel. Yad Vashem were ready to interview him. The wonderful reporter, uh, Dave Barry from, from Jerusalem Post, interviewed him as well. I, I actually sent you an article that uh, Dave Barry wrote, mm. front page news on the Jerusalem Post, a wonderful mm. article on, uh, on radio, yeah, Radius Discovery. He was front page news in the Jerusalem Post. I sent you the actual article. I, I've got the rest. I only sent you a snippet, mm. but it's a wonderful article. It gives it really praises praises his wonderful effort. I, I don't want to I don't want to end on a bad note, but Mr. Radio, after he obviously completed his the beginning of Corona, he took his own life. He wow. committed suicide. How old was he at made, the time? He must have been 20, 20, uh, 26, 27. Aww. Yeah, he was in the final final years of. Uh, and, I've lost them. and here he had filled his purpose, if you think about it, that he did this whole project and even connected everybody. Or, you know, yeah. as uh, that must have been very meaningful to him. Absolutely. But heartbreaking. He, saw, you know, he saw to it that we were connecting and he saw that even afterwards he asked us how did we, because we had connections afterwards, individuals, we spoke to different people at different times and he kept on, and there are two other Americans who kept in daily touch with him, also, mm. also, also Holocaust survivors. How amazing. Henry, Henry Wolf in America. And, uh, anyway, not... A, an incredible story from nowhere. Mm, amazing, and and Ronnie, for you, um, are you still in contact with some of the Zoom the the orphans? When I've uh, talks to them, I'm always there, but I I just intercept now and again because okay. he's so good at talking. So are you? <laughs> no, no, he's the one. I'm pleased you're still in contact. It must be very meaningful, though, to both it of you. It is very meaningful. Yes, yes. Now, Ava, yes, yeah, sorry, go on. I've no, no, carry on, carry on. I wanted to know another message that came through last week was. Uh, why was Ava uh, stabbed in a hostel in London? Okay, not London. I don't want to give London a okay. bad name. It wasn't it London. Was kind, kind of Wales. Okay. And you can give, get, rather give the Welsh a bad name. <laughs> okay. okay. Kind of well. Ronnie, I had been to London. I I'd hitchhiked through. I'd, we finished our army period after the ladies, so... The woman had left, Ronnie had gone back to the UK, gone back to London. She was making a life for herself. I think it was six months later, the men finished their army service, and I decided I was going to England, and I was going to hitchhike. I had a return ticket to South Africa. I could have used it anywhere. So I hitchhiked through Europe. It took me a long time. I took a ferry to Greece, hitchhiked through Europe, finally arrived in London. I proposed to Ronnie. She turned me down. I decided, well, once I'm here, I might as well see the country. So I hired a scooter, a motor scooter, and I traveled all over the place. I was in Wales. And the interesting thing about that is you weren't allowed to come on a motor, motor scooter or a vehicle to a, a youth hostel or to a seaman's hostel. And I slept in a seaman's hostel. So I left my motor scooter somewhere away and tied it up. And I was at the seaman's hostel. And there was an evening where I had a pack on my back. On my pack, it was an Israeli a uh, pack that I'd bought bought in Israel, and on the back had an Israeli mug and David and an Israeli flag. Anyway, I was, they, they obviously had a lot to drink, it was Siemens Hostel, they were all the same age as me, the early 20s, I should imagine, and one thing led to another, a couple of bad words, and I was a, I wasn't one to keep quiet, so I uh, intervened, and they intervened, and one thing led to another. We had actually had a brawl. Some people joined in on my side. The people in the hostel who ran the hostel joined in on my side, but there was fisticuffs and blows, and we we made a terrible mess. Was it they an anti-Semitic attack? 
It started with anti-Semitic attacks. Uh, started with bad word. Started with bad words about Jews and Israel and so on and so forth. And I just could have kept quiet. I could have wa- gone, walked away, but I didn't walk away. And of course, one thing led to another. And people joined in on my side as well. So it became became quite a brawl. <laughs> what was interesting about after the brawl, I was I was injured. I had I was bleeding badly from my right right hip from a stab wound. The, the the one of the house hostel directors came to me and said, look, we've reported to the police. You need to get out of here because you can't go to a hospital and they'll ask me where you got stabbed and you have, I'll help you bandage it quickly. And if my opinion, you have to get out of here because you're a foreigner, the rest of them are all locals, the for, seamen or wherever they came, and the police won't take kindly to you. And he actually helped me, bandaged me up like temporarily and I went I had my I didn't tell him I had a scooter I got on a scooter and I drove non-stop from Cardiff with a wound bleeding all the way to London straight to London we didn't have sea phones we didn't have these uh, wonderful telephones you've got today <laughs> and I knocked on the door and said Ronnie I'm here I need help and of course she bandaged me up with the bandaging we stayed together for a while she was with her, living with her parents the Luck family and she bandaged me up, looked after me. I managed to survive that. And uh, I, I proposed again. And this time, the silly girl accepted it. <laughs> we'll so. get back to that. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. And I'm back with Ava Wolf and, and Ronnie sitting on the side there and their daughter, Yaella's there. Um, um, Ava, one of the things I was going through a, a cashier at one of the grocery stores and someone asked me and I, I actually sent you a message to say, did you and Ronnie ever talk about the, your experiences and Ronnie's losses during the um, when she was little to your children? Did they know about your background? Yeah. It took a long time. It took a long time. It took many years, many years for Ronnie to actually open up and talk about. I think you were Army. Just before the army. Just before the army. Yeah, Ella says just before the army. So she she must have been just about eighteen at the time. So when she was first time, Ronnie actually sat and spoke about it. Ronnie was influenced by a, 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 a lovely lady who came from retired, came from uh, Australia, lived in our building, spent her life. She was a Holocaust survivor. She had a traumatic beginning. She'd passed away a few years ago, but she spent her life devoting time to talk about the Holocaust. And she kept on telling Ronnie, coming to our door, spoke to Ronnie, said, Ronnie, you have to talk about it. You have to get out. You have to talk about it because we're, we're, we're not going to be here much longer. Mm. And people need to know that it's a fact. There, there shouldn't be such a thing as a Holocaust denier. It shouldn't, shouldn't exist. And only people like you can force them to understand and recognize. It. So she had influenced Ronnie. And Ronnie spoke to my daughter, my daughter, 18 years old. So, I mean, 18 years it took Ronnie to pluck up the courage to talk to my daughter before she went to the army about her background. I suppose, I Ronnie, did you used to talk to Ronnie about it at all? I, I spoke to Ronnie. I knew, I knew. first of all, I knew her, her adopted mother. The adopted mother was Rachel, who was her real father's sister. Mm. She married an Englishman before the war, so I knew them. And I got a lot of information from Rachel. She was open with me. She was very open with me. And she gave me a lot of information. So I did speak to Ronnie about it. But she was... Not keen to speak to, not keen to speak about it, just generally. Um, I think it came from came from the I think came from the fact that when they were adopted, before they were adopted, they were told that no one should know that they came from wherever they came mm-hmm. from. So you imagine children of that age should have a secret like that. You tell a, a, a two year old, a three year old, a four year old, a five year old, tell them that she, the sister was older, a few years older. So you tell them. Never to say a word about your past. Tell them that you were you were our children. You what were, a burden to carry. What terrible a burden. burden. And terrible. and um Ronnie, just going to you before we told shortly to wrap up, but I just wanted to know once you had actually spoken about it, did you feel mm. better? Once you had told <laughs> your daughter? 
I was free. You were and that's free. what I loved mm. in life. How amazing. Um, freedom and justice. And it made me really uh, appreciate life more. I mm. didn't have to hide things. Mm. Mm. And sometimes I'm very outspoken, too much. But uh, I felt much better. Fantastic. And, better. and Ava, you, felt, you didn't feel that you needed to tell your children. Uh, Ro no, Ronnie's story. I, I thought it was Ronnie's Ronnie's task. I mm. never I never spoke about her. Mm. her it was Ronnie's job. She had to pluck up the courage. I felt to ha face it for herself as well and for her children. And you were by her side. You you said um, earlier that you had something that you wanted to uh, talk about. What was that? Uh, what I wanted to talk about is interesting. Interesting. We, we travelled in the far east. Very interesting. 1972. I can't. I've got the detail. I'll give it you quickly. 1972. We travelled in the far east. I was trying to do business. I was importing shoes at the time, and I was trying to do business. I was in Bangkok, and late at night, I booked a trip back to uh, the uh, destination was Frankfurt, and it was uh, the flight I'd booked. It was late at night. I came back to Ronnie in the hotel. I said, "Look, I booked. Unfortunately, I booked through Lufthansa at that time." We didn't buy any German goods. You obviously, you don't have to explain the reason. Mm. And she was against the flight. And we're in the middle of the night. We're flying the next morning very early. And she refused. She's not going to lift us. I already paid for the flight. I booked the flight. Frankfurt we had two stops on the way. And we're gonna, so what do I do? I go downstairs to the little bellboy. They are, no one on duty. And he helps me. The bellboy helps me. He finds Air China. I wasn't even sure that Air China flew anywhere. And it was like another five stops, leaving much earlier. We had to pack up and leave, and we end, end up in Frankfurt. But the interesting thing is that flight, that Lufthansa flight, had one of the Kennedy family on it. And the, I've got the detail of that flight, so people can look it up. It's 649. Hang on, give me the idea. We're the going flight. to have to wrap up, so finish the story. Okay. Yeah. I'll finish the story quickly. Anyway, the flight was hijacked. The flight ended up in Saudi Arabia wow. in the Saudi desert. That was the, the Lufthansa flight. Wow. Yeah, 1972, Lufthansa flight, mm. hijacked, ended up in the Saudi desert. So Roddy and I could have been on that flight. Roddy, for whatever reason, if you believe in fate, Roddy decided we're not going on that flight. And we didn't go. Wonderful. And you're here talking to me today, and I'm being told to wrap up. Ava, thank you so much for being with me. And Roni, thanks so much for you also being with me and Yela. And, you know, in, <laughs> I just want to stop with, stop with this. In Jan, uh, what's her name? Uh, Ivan La Van Zandt said, to me, freedom means having the power, the inherent right, the capacity and the ability to make choices that honor who I am. May you all wow. continue That's to exactly use the choices. That's exactly my, my sentiment. I'm going to send it to you. God bless and thank you so much for being with me.